So have you ever felt like you're in the dollhouse? Now, I didn't say doghouse, because some of you have been in the doghouse, but the dollhouse. Dollhouses. My father-in-law, a few years ago, built a beautiful dollhouse for our daughter, Melissa. For Mark, he built a cabin. Wanted just to make sure that uh, everything was fine that way. And then for uh, some of us, we remember the Bracys. Do you remember George and Marjorie Bracy? Delightful older couple. And I always enjoyed visiting them because I get a chance to go down into the basement into their uh, family room. And you may not know, but George and Marjorie were dollhouse collectors. And uh, they had spectacular dollhouses. And there was one in particular, which was likely the most fabulous dollhouse I've ever seen. A lot of little miniatures, everything so orderly. Um, it was estimated value of about $25,000. So we're talking uh, not just an ordinary dollhouse. But for some of you, when you think of dollhouses, you think of those Barbie dollhouses. And I'm sure that some of you, your children or others, uh, had a Barbie dollhouse. But you know, in a dollhouse, especially ones that kids play with, things can get uh, turned about. They can end up upside down. There's uh, a lot of potential for things to be cluttered and mixed up. Uh, beds, chairs, tables turned over. Sometimes it's because the family dog bumped into the dollhouse. Sometimes it's your little brother who decides he's going to mess with it. Someone has said that life is like being in a dollhouse. Um, you have all kinds of possibility of disruption and things getting out of order. It's when there are outside forces that seem to be beyond your control. The uh, hand of difficulty reaching in and uh, just kind of cluttering things up. Or it might be the fingers of conflict that turns things over. A lot of upheaval. In the Barbie movie, Barbie experiences a lot of upheaval in her life. Things had been going along quite smoothly. Um, not a lot of uh, events that were going on out of the ordinary. But then she runs into some unsettling conditions. Things seem to be mixed up and all upside down. And in her time of conflict and challenge, she goes on a quest for meaning, search, uh, search, uh, meaning significance, and uh, purpose in life. And uh, she's trying to find out what really matters in life. And can she find her true self-identity? Now, unfortunately, on this search, there is an absence of uh, a spiritual or a godly perspective but you know, in our series that we've entitled Ruth and Esther in a Barbie World, we discovered that Ruth as well experienced obstacles and a lot of upheavals in her life. She uh, experienced famine. Her husband, who uh, had come to Moab, died. She goes to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi, who really doesn't want Ruth around. So... Uh, Ruth is not in a good situation, but God, by his grace and mercy, by his providence, manages to turn the tables, and Ruth experiences purpose and meaning in her life. Then we've been looking at Esther more recently. Here's Esther, a young woman who uh, is living in exile in Persia. She and her foster father, Mordecai, had an opportunity to go back home, but like many of the Jewish people, they stayed in that area. Through a lot of circumstances, Esther ended up marrying the king of Persia. She became the queen. Things seemed to be going well for uh, Esther until 
uh, an evil guy by the name of Haman was promoted. Uh, he was a despicable guy, as we called him last week, a, a bad guy, a bully. Um, and he ended up, because he was upset with Mordecai, coming up with a decree or an edict that on a certain day in December of that time, uh, all the Jews were going to be exterminated. It was an awful, awful situation. Now, last week we saw that things seem to be starting to turn. Uh, Haman is uh, exterminated. He is no longer around. But the edict or the decree remains. There is still the very high potential that the people, of, the people who are Jewish, all the Jewish people, are going to be put to death. A very terrible thing. So we still have this clash. The battle is not over. This clash between what we call good and evil. That's why I've called this morning's message the Barbie Cup. Now some of you know that later today is the Grey Cup. The Montreal Alouettes against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I know that many are going to be cheering for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers but true confession, I am cheering for Montreal. I have a couple of reasons for it. The head coach of Montreal, Jason Moss, was Mark's coach out in Edmonton, treated Mark very well, and I'm kind of cheering for uh, Moss and his team. But also, Montreal are the heavy underdogs. And I don't know about you, but I always like cheering for the underdogs. I know some of you are thinking, and that's why you cheer for the Maple Leafs, but... <laughs> I like cheering for the underdog. And in this story of Esther, make no mistake, even at this point, at the end of chapter 7, Esther, Mordecai, and the Jewish people are very much the underdogs. Are they going to be able to pull out a victory against all these impossible odds? Well, this morning I have a very simple outline as we look at the last three chapters of the book of Esther. We're going to look at what I call the concern. And then we're going to talk about the confrontation or the conquest. We're going to look at this time of celebration. And then fittingly, we'll finish off with a conclusion. So if you've got your Bible, turn to uh, where we left off last week, Esther chapter 8. Uh, Carolyn will have it on the screen behind me. Esther chapter 8. We're going to look at the first eight verses. That same day, so this is the day that Haman is executed, the king gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Things are looking pretty good. But Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it is the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches of Haman that were devised to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? The king replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given the estate to Esther. I have impaled him on the pole that he set up. So you guys write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. So you see the problem. You've got uh, Haman's edict, which is still in effect, and uh, in uh, Esther and Mordecai's wisdom, uh, if that cannot be uh, eliminated, then there needs to be a, a new decree that would overrule 
or uh, be more powerful than the first decree. So you see this kind of uh, clash there. And in the verses we read, we see it begin with the elevation of a Jew, that is Mordecai, who ends up with the estate of Haman. And we know that Haman was a very wealthy man, so we're talking a whole lot of wealth. And then he is promoted to second in command, the uh, prime minister of the uh, Persian Empire. So you see his uh, elevation, and then you have this explanation from Esther to the king as to what the problem is that remains, and then this new edict. Uh, now, you have picked up over the last couple of weeks that I'm not a big fan of the king. I see him as a really weak and uh, incompetent leader. If I was to paraphrase these verses, the king is saying, I've done this for you, I've done that for you, it's your problem, you guys figure it out. Now, I think this is how the king was thinking, that Esther and Mordecai, don't worry, I'm going to protect you, I've, I've got your back. But as far as all the other Jews, don't, don't get all upset, they're kind of on their own, uh, whatever will be, will be. So I think part of the reason Esther pleads so passionately, you see Esther and Mordecai's priority. And what strikes me, and this is an important lesson, they put the well-being of others ahead of their own welfare. Or you could put it in another way, they put the welfare of others even ahead of their own well-being. I love these values that we see in Esther and Mordecai because we saw it reflected in Ruth and in Boaz when we studied through the book of Ruth. This idea of loving kindness, this idea of being concerned about others. It was Jesus who said, people are going to know you are my disciples if you love one another, if you care about, if you have compassion for other people. We live in a very egotistical, narcissistic world, don't we? And we need people who have that kind of compassion, that kind of concern. And did you notice in verse 6, the, the pronouns? Uh, how can I see or bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? When I think of Esther weeping and pleading with the king, I think of some of you moms and some of you dads who are pleading for the salvation of your child, who are urging God to draw back that child who has turned away from the Lord. Maybe for you it's a parent, it might be a spouse, it might be a friend, and you can relate very much to Esther in that level of concern. And when I think of the terminology here, my people and uh, my family, I'm reminded of what it means to be part of the family of God. If you're a believer, did you know that your true identity, your very best identity, is that you are part of the people of God? The argument of 1 Peter 2 is, you're not some kind of random individual. You are a people. And I would propose to you one of the best ways to affirm your identity as a child of Christ and part of his family is to identify with a local church. In this day and age, I know a lot of people choose to be free agents at arm's distance. We don't want to get too involved or too committed, but we need to have that kind of passion, that kind of priority placed on being part of the family of God. So Jason Moss, the coach of Edmonton back then, now the coach of Montreal, I remember Mark sharing with me before one important game said to the fellows on the team, take a look at your uniforms. On the back of your uniform is your name. 
It might have been Smith. It might have been Jones, Mackey. He said, now what I want you to do is take a look at the name on the front of your uniform. And that was the team name. And he said, men, that's who you're playing for. And we need to recapture that. We are part of a family. When one of us rejoice, we are called to rejoice. When one is going through difficulty, when one is mourning, we are called to be there for them. I think as a church, we do that well. We could likely do it better. And we need your help. We need your involvement to know what it means to bear the responsibilities that come with being part of a church, but also to enjoy the immense privileges that come there. Have I been a little too heavy on this point? I I really have a passion for the church. Jesus, uh, we're told by Paul in Acts 20, shed his blood for the church. Jesus never, ever sees his followers as random individuals. We are part of a family. We belong to the people of God. Well, let's move on. And Carolyn's got a bunch of scriptures here for us. You're going, so they come up with the new edict. What was the edict? Okay, sit back, roll up your sleeves. The king's edict, this is verse 11, granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do so in all the province of the king, coincidentally, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, so that the Jews would be ready on the day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Let's slip down to chapter 9, the first verse. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemy of the Jews has hoped to overpower them, but now, interesting phrase, the tables were turned. And the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities and in all the provinces of the king to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because of fear of, because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His rep- uh, reputation spread throughout the provinces And he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. Down to verse 11. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that day. There would have been 500. The king said to King Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed the 500. Also the 10 sons of Ammon in the citadel of Susa. Uh, What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will also be granted. And here we have our image of beautiful Queen Esther. Esther, mild and meek. She goes, well, if it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also. And let Haman's sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. A little bit later, verse 16, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves, get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but not lay hands on any of the plunder. So I've entitled this little section that is super easy, super straightforward, um, Confrontation, Conquest, and Controversy. 
it's almost impossible to look at this passage and ignore what's going on in our world today. Many of us may ask, is this relevant? Does this apply to what's going on in our world situation today? One of the challenges we have is how do we interpret the edict where it says they can assemble and protect themselves. It goes on to say destroy, kill, and exterminate the enemy. Um, Back in high school, this may shock you, but I was on the chess team. I am not good in chess. I shared this with somebody the other day, and they said, John, you were likely on the chess team because you were a nerd in high school. I said, that's very unkind, but it might have been true. I was not a good player, but I enjoyed uh, watching others beat me, and uh, it was uh, interesting to see their moves. But I remember one friend who was very good at chess saying, John, we hear this in other sports, the best defense is a good offense. And I guess conversely, the best offense is a good defense. It's what works in chess. And the tough question is, is it what works in war? What does it mean to defend oneself? What is the limit? What are some of the restrictions? What should be some of the restraints that we show? I would argue from my understanding of the verb usage in this verse that it can mean either to stand in order to protect or to rise up, but it does carry with it the idea of being in that position of protecting oneself and one's family, and it may involve uh, acts that are um, of of an offense uh, nature. I do notice, and you maybe have picked it up, that it was involving the armed men. Uh, No mention is made of the women and children, but full disclosure, there are other passages in the Old Testament. Josh read one of them two weeks ago where uh, God commands uh, the Israelites to destroy the men, the women, and the children. Uh, of, of the Malachites back in 1 Samuel chapter 15. So what are some ob- observations for us? And these are rapid fire for two or three reasons. One, I find this a, a difficult topic and I don't want to overdwell on it, but I do want to make a couple of ob- observations. So I need to tell you that I'm very conflicted when it comes to Esther chapters 8 and 9. Um, I find that it's a, a difficult uh, part of the book of Esther. And uh, I'm always concerned when it comes to Old Testament narrative, how we handle it. Uh, some of you are interested in hermeneutics, and this is a very good example of what we do with this kind of passage, especially when it comes to the question of is it relevant, is it applicable today? And one of the things I always stress when I was teaching at the Bible College to the students was make a distinction between what would be a prescription and what would be a description. I'm not convinced that what we have described here in chapters 8 and 9 is the pattern for any conflict, uh, how every kind of situation should be handled. And so we need to appreciate the uniqueness in that situation. There are basically three approaches, right, in the Christian world to the idea of of war or battling. There's the uh, activist approach, which is, sure, we are the people of God or we're a country of gods. We should be aggressive. If we feel like uh, invading Iceland tomorrow because it's got a lot of resources, we should go for it uh, just so that we can have more and more resources, I don't believe that uh, approach is supported in Scripture. Another approach, which is very popular, is what we call pacifism, where somebody says war is never right. Killing another person should never be uh, the Christian position. Sometimes they will point to statements like in the, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Or the, the statement that Jesus made, do not resist one who is evil. But as we discovered last week in our uh, study on the Sunday night, someone uh, mentioned, I thought this was uh, very insightful, 
Jesus' statement to the disciples, which has caused Bible scholars a lot of concern when Jesus says to the disciples, um, now, by the way, you've got your tunics, you've got your money bags, do you have a couple of swords? And uh, they kind of looked around, no, and they said, well, you should uh, sell your cloaks and get a couple of swords. And so we are puzzled. Why was that important? Why did that matter? At best, it might have been for a defensive purpose. Because we know that only a few later verses later in Luke 22, um, the disciples, you remember they were taking Jesus, and it was Peter actually took one of those swords and sliced off the ear of one of the, one of the soldiers, one of the guards, and Jesus rebuked him for it. So what am I saying? Well, even in Jesus' ethic, you see a little bit of tension, a little bit of, of conflict. One has said about pacifism that the greater evil is to not resist uh, an evil person or an aggressor, but to fight against him. If somebody breaks into your home, should you resist? If somebody's about to kidnap your child, if somebody is about to violate your wife, should there be some kind of resistance, even if it involves uh, some kind of injury or death? Uh, one has also said, all that is missing for evil to triumph is for a good man to do nothing. Some of you know that one of the Bible heroes, or one of the Christian heroes for me, is a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Bonhoeffer, you may know, was a pacifist, and a very strong pacifist. It comes reflected in his writing. But he changed. His convictions changed, and he was one of the German leaders who advocated that Hitler should be assassinated. Now, that was something that Bonhoeffer struggled with, but he came to that conclusion. So this is a prickly area. It's a tough area where we need a lot of wisdom and a lot of discernment. I fully agree that God warns those who curse Israel, and I would submit that that warning persists to today. My red flag goes up when I see Christians overcritical of the Jews in Israel. Anti-Semitism has no place anywhere, and especially in the Christian church. We owe our heritage to our Jewish background. But make no mistake, Israel is blessed, just as we are blessed, to bless others. And the promise to Abraham is to extend to all peoples of the world. Jews, Arabs, Christians, Muslim, there's no limitations. Early this morning, I was reading through Genesis 16. Once again, the story of Hagar. And then into Genesis 21. Remember when she's banished? You know, Hagar, who is kind of the, the mother of the Arab nations today. And when she's banished, all alone, the Lord finds her. She names her boy Ishmael, which means the Lord sees. And then into Genesis 21, she's banished again. And this time, her little boy is weeping. He's thirsty. There's no water. The Lord hears Hagar sobs, and he hears the little boy weeping. And Jesus comes to the rescue. Does Jesus care about the people in Gaza? You better believe it. I believe one of the simple verses in the Bible that is profound, for God so loved the world. Who does that exclude? No one. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. You may say, John, it's impossible to be both pro-Israel and pro-the Arab nations. Well, I'm willing to try to live with that impossibility. And I think as Christians we should be as supportive as we can 
realizing that we live in a world where there's a lot of injustice. Please don't interpret anything I'm saying that way. We are to fight for justice. We want to see justice prevail. But even in these battles in Esther chapter 8 and 9, they were pursuing peace. The word that's used a couple of times in chapters 8 and 9 is relief or rest. And that's what we should be pursuing. Um, I don't think it's wrong to pray for peace in the Mideast. Nor do I think it wrong for us to remind people that in a week or two, we're going to be celebrating Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. And we are going to be able to hold that ultimate hope. As the angels declared to the shepherds, there will be peace on earth. And that's something that we need to hold to tenaciously. Well, what about Esther? <laughs> Love to skip by Esther's actions, but someone asked me last week, and I promised I would answer it today. So what's Esther doing? The, it seems like the sons of Haman have already been killed, so why is she asking to impale them? Let me be really simple, uh, very clear here. They were dead. It would be the corpses of Haman's sons that would be impaled. And some of you are thinking, how cruel, how sadistic. I had this image of Queen Esther, a lovely Jewish Christian girl. And you say to yourself, how could she be so barbaric? Two explanations, they may not satisfy you, but it's the best I can do. Um, you also notice that she requested that the edict continue into the next day in Susa. They were still enemies. They were, they were still in danger. They still had to be on the offensive. And then, which I would argue, the ten sons impaled on these tall poles would be a pretty strong deterrent. Don't mess with Esther. Maybe you shorten it. Don't mess with us. Um, don't mess with the Jewish people. There is an element of deterrence there. And again, full disclosure, I am not promoting that as the way we should be or way we should handle conflict. And in fact, we could talk a whole lot more about what the Bible says about retaliation, about revenge, uh, making distinctions between a personal response and a a corporate or a national response. And you know, my final comment on this point, we parked on it for a while. It's okay to be conflicted. It's okay to say, this isn't simple stuff. Um, I hope you and me, we never lose our sensitivity. I don't like to see anybody hurt. I don't want to see anybody facing uh, the prospect of death or uh, being attacked or annihilated, so we, we need to have that balance. So let's shift real quick. I'm only going to spend a couple minutes on the last couple of points, celebration and remembrance. Um, I am just, uh, Carolyn, I'm just going to summarize here. I want to be sensitive to our time this morning. So what we see, and if you can read this through yourself maybe this afternoon, in the remainder of chapter 9, is the table's turn. The Jewish people had been experiencing sorrow as they anticipated this day where they were going to be exterminated. Now they were experiencing joy. Their weeping was turned to rejoicing. And the celebration involved eating and drinking and giving gifts to one another, even looking after the poor. Um, and then, of course, we have in chapter 9 the establishment of the festival of Purim. Uh, the word pur. Uh, tra taken from the, the word that means a lot, or in our case, like dice. Uh, Haman established the date for the extermination of the Jews on the basis of rolling the dice. Um, the tables turned on Haman and on his edict, and now you've got this festival that our Jewish friends still celebrate to this day. Now, you will notice that uh, this is not a festival that God inaugurated, um, it was one that the people came up with. So if you were to ask me, is this on the same level as Pentecost? I would say no, but it's still an important festival, important time of remembrance. 
Just like the other day, somebody asked me, as Christians, should we celebrate Christmas? Where does it say in the Bible that we are to celebrate Christmas? Full disclosure, it doesn't. However, I believe that we should always take advantage of any and every festival in our culture. And this happens to be a time where your neighbors and friends and others recognize what we call Christmas. And so I say, let's go for it. Let's take it and celebrate it for all the right reasons. And as we think of the birth of Jesus, we go way beyond that. We think of his birth, his life, and his death on the cross for us. Seize the opportunity and take advantage of it. And then the Feast of Purim it would involve a whole lot of remembrance, this idea of remembering what was accomplished on behalf of the uh, people of Israel. There were the stories that were generated, and uh, they had that opportunity to share many, many stories amongst each other. Uh, we celebrate communion, which is for us a sharing of our stories, a sharing of our collective experiences, and we need to take advantage of that as well. I think in many ways that we don't celebrate well, and I would encourage us to work hard at this idea of celebrating well. I think of uh, John Steinbeck in his novel, The East of Eden, where he talks about a character named Liza Hamilton. He describes her as a tight, hard little woman, humorless as a chicken. She had a code of morals that pinned down and beat the brains out of nearly everything that was pleasant to do. She was suspicious of fun, whether it involved dancing or singing or even laughter. She felt that people having a good time were wide open to the devil. So the lesson here for you and me is, let's be a people who embrace celebration, who say that it's appropriate and okay to uh, celebrate and to remember all that the Lord has done for us. Esther ends with its conclusion in chapter 10. Um, and again, I'd encourage you to read through chapter 10. Um, three verses that, first of all, talk about what the king does, and there's never a bad time for a king to come up with more taxes. So he institutes some taxes at the start of chapter 10, but on the other hand, Mordecai is working in a way that is very fair um, and compassionate and thinking about the people. So let's finish this series from Master with a question. Why does God seem hidden? Why does God seem silent in the book of Esther? You know, Esther is the only book in the Bible where God's name is not mentioned. Um, there's two possibilities. One is Esther, Mordecai, and others could not be overt. And, and I know some of you are in situations, particularly maybe in a, a public or what we might call a secular setting, where it's shrewd, it's the wise thing to not be overly overt, maybe with the mention of God, but there's subtle ways that you can communicate the gospel message. But it could also be that Esther and Mordecai and the Jewish people we're not in the best of spiritual condition. We have a tendency to put some of our Bible heroes up on a pedestal, but it could be that they weren't quite the way they should have been in terms of their relationship with God. But that leads to an exciting closing principle. God's providence is always greater than our perfection. If God's care for you and me is based on how perfect we are, we're in trouble. God is sovereign. God protects us. So this is my statement. God's providential care, even we, when we don't exhibit or demonstrate uh, a significant interest in him, uh, and maybe we're undeserving of his work on our behalf, he still intercedes for us because of his grace. It's like that dollhouse. Things are cluttered. Things have been turned over. 
God our Father takes the top off the dollhouse. He reaches in. He rearranges things. He turns things around. And that's what we celebrate today. And what's exciting to me is that that God wins. The one who is sovereign, the one who is exhibiting providential care to us is the one who wins. And when we put our trust and faith in Christ, we are on the winning side. I'm going to ask uh, Rick to come up now. Next week we start our Christmas series, so we're looking forward to that. Stand with us as we close with a song.